um, I guess we can start now. So um, today we will be discussing um, convexity, especially on um, the definition of convex and also um, the positive semi-definite. Um, as you probably have learned in the course, but like not very concrete. Um, so today we'll be reviewing convexity, um, probably things that you learned in linear algebra. Cool. Um, so maybe let's get started. And if you have questions, we could, uh, at the end, you can raise and we can discuss. Cool. Um, so just a brief, uh, quick review on like convex function for um, the definition of a convex function. So basically it's in this. So a way to look into this function, which means that um, you are, so you, you are given a, b in the, uh, in the real space, and then you have a stator that's between zero and one. And now you have a function f, and we said that function f is convex when you have this equation. Uh, this inequality holds for O a, b, and O theta between zero and one. So uh, one way to see this is that we can plug in like theta equals uh, one half. Then you will see that um, things at the left become like um, a over two and plus b over two. So that basics basically means that like uh, things at the left hand side become at the bottom point and thing at the right hand side at the uh, at the top. So that's what we call uh, convex, which means that um, the thing, um, the your curve, when you draw a line between two points, the curve will always be beneath the, uh, the straight line between A and B. Um, so that's, um, so basically for every convex function, you have the cup shape uh, or U shape. Uh, uh, basically, it will look like a U shape. And so, um, and so basically the theta here is that you can actually move from anywhere between A and B. So if theta is uh, one over two, then it will be at the middle, middle point. And if you have theta smaller, then you will move to the left. If you have theta larger than um, closer to one, then you will move to the right. So basically that means that um, for every point um, in between uh, A, B, you have the, uh, the value of the curve beneath, is beneath the, um, the straight line between uh, F, A and F. So basically, that's how we view convex function. And this is for the, um, um, okay, let me see what's this next slide. Nothing. Okay, so this is for convex function. And if we are speaking about strictly convex, then that means that we will change the inequality into uh, removing the equality uh, equal sign. And then we have also a, uh, like that's not equal to uh, B. And on the other hand, like uh, concave is just defined in the opposite way that you have uh, like larger than or equal to sign in the equation. And they that would uh, end into um, a U-shape uh, pointing downward. And so basically that means that uh, and anything on the curve will uh, lie above the uh, straight line you draw, the red line here. Cool. And so here are some properties of a convex function. Say um, f is convex, then minus f is concave, which is like uh, the case here. Like you have the f as convex, and then if you draw the minus f, negative f, then you will get the concave function. And also we have several different properties like FG are both convex and you have F plus G is convex. And if you have FG both convex, then max FG is also convex. So there are tons of different properties, but these are very useful things. 
Um, so one, um, one easy, uh, I mean, one benefit, uh, like one test to test if a function is convex is through the second derivative uh, test. And it means that uh, if its second derivative is non-negative everywhere, then this function is convex. So um, as you see here, um, like is um, like for example, we have like x squared. Um, let me see how can I draw. Cool. Um, so basically, uh, this function looks like whoops. Okay, um, oops, so ugly, but basically <laughs> like, uh, here, uh, let me throw it, um, yeah. So obviously this is, oops, um, so we have fx equal x squared like this. So obviously this is a, um, a, a convex function because it's like u shape and facing upward, but we can see that like f uh, prime x is two x, f double prime x, like second derivative is two, and this is always uh, larger than zero. And for any x in real space, so if this is true, like uh, f prime uh, f double prong x is non-negative everywhere, then we can say uh, this function is convex. Now, how about um, um, like multivariate function? That's when things get um, interesting. So now we have a function of, um, of uh, r like in the space of like d dimension, and then we, like um, map to a real number. So now uh, we have a similar thing that we have this definition, this second derivative test. So now we said this function is convex if its matrix of second derivatives is positive semi-definite everywhere. So the key point is that we have the matrix of second derivatives and it's positive semi-definite. So that's the thing that we will discuss uh, in the following slides. So first that we let's discuss like what's the first derivative of multivariate function. So this is usually called the gradient. And so it's basically uh, very simple. So we have a Z which denotes a vector. Uh, so it's like, oops, like Z1, blah, 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 to ZD. And so we basically just take uh, this function and then we take the partial derivative toward each, um, each dimension. So we take like uh, partial f partial z1 uh, toward partial f to partial zd. So the, the first derivative is a vector. And usually we will call this as, a grade, as the gradient, like the gradient descent stuff. And now um, we want to see the second derivatives of this multivariate functions. So this is how we define it. So basically it will be a D by D matrix and it's called the Haitian. And so we have several uh, entries. So for each entry, we have a partial F and then we have two uh, different, uh, can be equal, but like two um, dimensions. So we can write this as like um, H F I J equal to partial F partial Z I partial Z J. Sometimes you will see this form, like um, probably in this form. So basically, that means like um, for the ice column, uh, ice row ice column and like J row, you will get like partial F, partial I, partial J, ZJ. 
Yeah. And so this is also called, uh, this is also the Jacobian matrix uh, of the gradient. Okay, um, any questions so far? Um, good. Oh, it's second derivative. <laughs> okay, so so now we uh, we have this like uh, now we have the second derivatives become the Haitian matrix that we just defined here, and now we want to discuss what's positive semi indefinite. So so let's see the uh, official definition, and we will go into detail what this actually means. So um, we said a. Uh, of a symmetry matrix is positive semi-definite if for all z um, a vector so this is a vector so all vector z we have this um this term so you will see like what what exactly is this guy so zt mz is actually um you can represent as this. So basically you can think of like, uh, this is like ZT is like Z1, blah, 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 to ZD. And then you have the M matrix, like M11, M, uh, D1, M1D, blah, 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 MDD. Oops, wrong side. Um, this is transpose. Um, so we actually have uh, this one. Yeah, so usually we were set uh, our data is in column vector. That's the default form. And so basically, if you uh, expand this guy, and you will see that it's actually equal to this. And so it's a scalar, basically. So this is a scalar. And it's like, um, it's larger than zero. Uh, if it's like non negative, then we will set um, this matrix M is positive semi definite. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, we could, oh, I saw a chat, let me see. Have a lot of equal terms. Um, yeah, um, so let me see, because you have M, I, J. Yeah, 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 so you will have lots of equal terms. Exactly, but at the you know at the diagonal um, diagonals, it will be different because there is no canceling out stuff. Or say you have like equal terms. Um, all right. So here's a hierarchy of square matrix. So the very the biggest collection is all the square matrix. That's like d by d matrix. And we also have symmetry matrix, which means like if you transpose it, it's the, still the same. And now we have positive semi-definite. It's always, uh, M is always uh, symmetric, but we also have this, um, um, this condition uh, or say definition of positive semi-definite. And now finally, we also have the positive definite. Um, so notice that we have a semi here. So for positive definite, that means like um, whenever for all z e um, not equal to zero, we have uh, the uh, inequality pose. Anyway, so it will be positive at any time. Z transpose and z. Yeah, but for this course, we were probably mostly talking about positive semi-definite. Um, so now let's look into some examples. So first, like uh, if M is a square matrix of one, then is it positive semi-definite? 
Um, any idea how we can approach this? Um, I just go ahead. <laughs> um, so usually, yeah, exactly. We can take any Z. So that's the point. So it's actually hard to see PSD uh, easily. So the easiest thing that we do is that we can just suppose for whatever Z equal to uh, Z1, Z2, and then we see um, what's going on. So if we plug in Z1, Z2 into this, um, what is not working? Okay, uh, into this um, term, then we will become like Z1, Z2 transpose and times the matrix and Z1, Z2. And then if you expand it, it will become um, big things. And so you will have this times this and this times this, and you will end up with like this form, Z1 plus Z2 squared. And because we have this square here, that basically means that this is always to be non-negative. Even if like Z1, Z2 is zero, it will be zero. So it's like always um, non-negative. So we can, um, whoops. So yes, we can set that this is positive semi -definite. Now, what about this matrix? So similarly, uh, if people are asking you how to prove PSD, there are some other ways, but uh, the easiest thing that you can do is just plug in whatever Z1, Z2, and then to see if you can get the equation holds or you can find an, a counter example. So in this case, um, let's plug in Z1, Z2 again. So now, because we have different terms here. So we have this. So Z1 time, uh, plus two Z2 become the first term. Oops, I think I, um, yeah, it's in here. Anyway, <laughs> so that's what you will get. Um, Z1 plus two Z2 in the first term and then Z1, two Z1, one, uh, Z2 in the second term. And then if you expand it, it will become this guy. And so the problem is that, is this um, always to be positive or non-negative? Um, certainly it's not true if you um, try different values. And now you can see that actually, um, okay, I modify my slide, but it doesn't propagate to this one. Okay, so z equal one minus one is an obvious uh, counter example. If you plug in this into here, then you will get like one plus five one minus one plus minus one square, which is like minus three. So obviously, uh, this can be uh, can be positive. And remember that uh, in positive semi-definite is that we want this to hold for O Z in R D. So we find a counterexample and that prove that uh, this metric is not positive semi-definite. Any? Question so far? Cool. Um, so now it's still very um, like vague what positive semi-definite is. And so now we can have a geometric view of PSD. So recall that um, uh, probably uh, in linear algebra, in whatever course you have taken, um, we, we said that like a metric corresponds to a linear transform. So remember that um, we will said, um, so for whatever M matrix, you can put into like, um, like 
a Z here, basically. And then MZ will transform. So Z after M will be transformed into another vector. So note that like um, uh, MZ is like a function of Z that max Z to MZ. And it's in the same space. It's still a vector, so we can say that it is a linear transform. So now a geom geometry view of PSD is that we have MZ uh, and Z transpose. And remember that uh, ZT, Z transpose, MZ, is basically Z dot MZ. So usually, um, quickly, uh, like dot product. So when we are talking about like u dot v, sometimes we will we can um, say it's basically u transpose v. So oftentimes in linear algebra, you will see these two things um, like used being used uh, interchangeably, but mostly in the right hand side form. And because we are assuming both are column vector. UD, then you have V1 to VD. And so if you transpose it, then you become U blah, blah, blah. And this guy is V blah, blah, blah. And so if you calculate this, it's basically just the definition of um, um, that product but you remove this dot and then becomes a oh, metric uh, computation. So now what it means in this uh, definition is that Z dot MZ like should be uh, non-negative. And that actually basically means that this uh, the transformed uh, vector still have the positive uh, scalar pro projection on the original vector. So let's say um, uh, the original vector is one minus one. So, so we have one minus one point this way. So this is original, um, the original vector. And then after we transform it with the matrix, it becomes minus one, one. So it becomes here. So this is empty. And so you can see that they are in exact the opposite direction. So this means that it's not positive semi-definite. So what we want is that we want like uh, for every Z after the transpose and Z, we want it to still have the uh, positive um, projection here. So say we have some M prom Z that always keep the, the direction of Z after transport, uh, after the transform, it will still keep in the same general direction, like facing uh, button right. So that's a um, geometry view of PSD. So you can think of it like um, it's still, um, it's a transform, but it's um, not changing its direction um, drastically. Like you got still having um, the non-negative scalar projection. So this is a geometry view for PSD because uh, when I was learning linear algebra, you know, PSD, you only see this, um, you only see this term and you actually uh, probably wouldn't realize what it actually mean. Yeah. Cool, any questions so far? Good. All right, um, so let's move on. Um, so now let's also think about a special case where we have a diagonal matrix. Say we have A1 and everything zero, A2, oops. So this is a spatial case. And we want to know when will this matrix be PSD? positive semi-definite. 
Any idea? No? So, yeah, so again, that's just plug in whatever Z, and that's the, how it goes. Yeah, exactly, when all the values are non-negative. So this can be seen if you just plug in whatever Z1 to ZD, and then you expand it. Um, so expand it like this, and you will end up with this term. So it's basically A1, Z1 squared, uh, plus A2, Z2 squared, to A, D, Z, D squared. So notice that uh, everything here is like, um, is non-negative. And all the coefficient has to be non-negative so that for whatever, um, uh, whatever thing after it, it's a non-negative term. So if we want this to be uh, always non-negative, we would need like A1, uh, basically A1 be non-negative, A2 non-negative, blah, 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 to AD non-negative. So, so that's the, the condition when a diagonal matrix would be uh, PSV. So when all its elements are non-negative and by elements, it's basically like diagonal elements. Yeah, so here is the thing. Um, since it's a sum, sum could be negative and still have the sum to be uh, non-negative, that's correct. But what about, because uh, we are talking about O, Z here. So let's consider a case that um, we assume that, uh, let's assume um, Z2 to ZD are O zero. And so now we will end up with, uh, we are discussing what Z1 can take. So now we have, uh, A1, Z1 square larger than zero. We want this to happen. And this is already non-negative. So we will end up with uh, A1 being um, non-negative. So you're right. Uh, um, since it's a sum for some Z, uh, you will end up with some like positive turn and negative turn that cancel out but because we are um, aiming for OZ. And in the case when um, Z2 to ZD are O0, which is possible. And in this case, we will need A1 to be uh, non-negative so that you still have the uh, non-negative sum. And then you can do this, basically do this for O. For o I. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the uh, another way to see that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um. Um. No. Uh, no. We have. Yeah, depends on what other AI is. Yeah. Um, no, you, you have to, yeah, you have to be all non-negative. Yeah. It's not depends on what other AI is. It actually depends on what other Z is. And because we are aiming for uh, O Z. So you have to be true for every Z. And that makes like uh, A1 to AD must be O non-negative. Um, cool. So basically that means like A1 to AD. So basically AI be non-negative for I equal to one to D. So that's the criteria that we will be using later. Yeah. Okay. So now that's the, um, 
So now we, we, we go back to the second derivative test for convexity. So now we have the function um, from like multivariate function, and we want to see if it's convex. And we said it's convex if it's Hessian. Uh, remember what's Hessian? It's basically like um, partial z, partial f, partial z, i, z, j, and then you have o, d, i, j, then you will get a huge matrix. And so if this Haitian is positive semi-definite everywhere, which basically means for all z, uh, yeah. And so let's see an example. Like, um, so this is a function fz, it's the norm square, square norm. So this is basically um, a function of r squared, uh, rd to r. So z is a vector. Okay, so, um, whoops, everything comes out. Anyway, <laughs> so let's look at this first. Um, so by definition, the square norm is basically just um, um, every entry square, and then we just sum it up. So this is the definition of the uh, square norm. And um, so now we can compute the gradient. So we take this, this, this term, <laughs> and then we take the partial derivative uh, uh, over different z1 to zd. So when we take this to our uh, partial z1, then uh, anything that's not z1 will be zero. So we will end up with like uh, zero one squared um, partial z1. So we will get two z1. And similar thing apply to other things. So we will get two zd at the end. So this is basically just two z. So like 2z1, 2zd. Cool. So now, uh, how about the Haitian function? Um, the Haitian matrix. So Haitian means that you take f and then you take partial derivative um, toward any two dimension. So that's the, um, so in the diagonal terms, you will see basically it's like partial f, um, partial z1 squared. And so we already see that it's two z1. So if we take one, uh, let's see, let's write it this way. So we already know like if we take it toward uh, z1 partial, then we will get this guy. And so we take second derivative, then we will get two. So in the diagonal, we will get O2, like two in the O diagonal elements. And for other things, you will see that um, it's actually zero. So if partial F, um, partial ZI, partial ZJ is basically partial, partial ZI, and partial F, partial ZJ. So remember that uh, partial f, partial zj is 2zj. And so we are taking zj over zi, this is i. And so it's basically zero. And so that's why everything uh, outside of the diagonal would be zero. And so we will end up with like 2id. And so is 2id positive semi-definite? Um, yes. Why? Because we just said that um, it's a diagonal matrix and the diagonal matrix is PSD whenever all the, um, all the diagonal elements are non-negative. Whoops. Okay, anyway, yeah. So, it's PSD. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's all for the PSD stuff. Um, any questions so far?
Yeah, so to sum up, um, the multivariate function is much complicated than a single variable function, where in single variable function, we are taking second derivative, it's super easy to compute. And now we are talking about multivariate, then we need to compute this uh, special Haitian matrix. And then instead of being non-negative, it becomes like positive semi-definite, which is more like an way to set if it's uh, non-negative in the metric space. Um, um, yeah, uh, I'm not going to cover this, but yeah, that's a special case. Yes, exactly. So there are several tests that you can see how PSD could be, um, to be verified. And yeah, so lots of different, um, variation. So that's one way, like if a, if a metric that can be decomposed into um, like another BBT form, then it will be always be um, PSD. Um, yeah, that can be actually seen by if you are taking, um, I think it's just, so we have like V, C, and Z, right? And so if this matrix can be decomposed, yeah, exactly. And so you can rearrange this into Z, T, V, and then B transpose Z. And know that this is basically just B, T, Z, transpose BTZ. So now suppose this is a, so this is a back, uh, this is not a vector, it's a, it's a scatter. So it's much more easier. So it's basically just uh, BTZ square. Yeah, it's a dot product and also it's a scatter. So it's basically just this thing. Know that this is a scalar. Um, here, B is also a vector. Yeah, so that's a special case. Like when you, whenever you can decompose a matrix into this form, if you can find that form, um, which is not always easy to find, and, but if in some case you get this uh, matrix represent already in this form, then you will always be positive semi-definite, yeah. And also like there are like, uh, for every covariance matrix that would be always positive semi-definite. And so lots of different criteria that a matrix could be positively semi-definite, yeah. But the, the very fundamental way to see that is just plug in whatever Z1 to ZD and to see if the inequality hold or you can find, an, uh, find a context symbol. Cool. Um, let me stop sharing. Is there any question? Um, actually, I have also another slide for, let me see. I can quickly go through that. It. Yeah, also quickly go through the gradient descent stuff. Yeah, so probably this will also be discussed in the next discussion, but we could like quickly uh, recap what have been taught in the class. Um, so for gradient descent, I made an animation so that you can easily see what's going on. So the pseudocode of gradient descent looks like this. So we choose an initial weight vector. So suppose um, we, we are in the 
axis of W because we are interested in uh, optimizing this W vector. And we have a learning rate, um, shoot, I forgot how to pronounce, eta, right? Yeah, so repeat until convergence, we just uh, update uh, the weight with this update rule. And so what does this actually mean? So first we, we see that uh, the slope at this point is basically the gradient here. And so the slope is larger than zero. And so if we time the um, negative eta, it becomes the adjustment toward, it's a negative adjustment. So now we move W zero negatively. So it will become another new W1. And then now again, we compute the slope again. And so we have uh, still a positive gradient. And that means that we want the adjustment to be negative. So notice that why there is a negative sign, because whenever the slope is, uh, is positive, which means that you are going toward uh, uh, rising or say increasing uh, on this curve. And so you want, because you are finding the minimal point. So you want to in the backward direction. So that's why we have the negative uh, sign here. And so like if you do this several times and you will end up with um, like it will gradually converge to the minimum point somewhere here probably. And so as you can see, um, the slope actually define how we update it. So when the slope is larger, uh, it would end up with a larger adjustment. So this term would be larger if the slope is larger. So at first it will like, uh, like move fast to a negative direction and then it gradually converge. That's why gradient descent would converge to the minimal point whenever your function is convex. So that's why we are talking about convex function here, that uh, when we have a convex function, we can um, uh, basically, if you have a convex function, your local minima will be your global minima. And that's why gradient descent will always guarantee that you get the local minima, which happens to be uh, the global minima for um, a convex function. And so in class, we also talk about uh, stochastic gradient descent. So by stochastic, which means that uh, we are not uh, computing the gradient, um, the total gradient, or sometimes in like the gradient of the function. Oh, let, let's just put it up. Um, so originally we are um, talking about eta gradient f w t. So this is an original form. So this uh, f is called the loss function or whatever, like your objective function that you want to minimize. And so in many cases uh, in a machine learning problem, this can be decomposed into um, each sample. So the i here is the samples. So for each sample, we can compute its loss function or its objective function. And then we sum it up, we get the total uh, loss. So this is the total loss. And this is sum of sample loss. Yeah. So in many cases in ML problems, we have this form. So now we are not computing the total loss because it's very uh, computationally costly. So we basically just compute each uh, loss function on the on one simple uh, one sample. So the pseudo code becomes this: like we choose the same like an initial weight vector dub zero and the learning rate, and then repeat until it converges. Now we are randomly. That's why we have this stochastic here. We randomly pick a sample uh, x i y i, and then we update the weight based on this. Uh, update rule. So basically we are replacing the total loss um, by the sample loss. And in practice, um, how we pick this sample is not always friendly. We can, for example, we can first 
randomly shuffle all the data set and then just run through the whole data set. It will have the similar effect of like randomly picking a sample at every iteration. So this is what it looked like for a stochastic gradient descent. So originally we would expect like something like very smooth to this guy. So this is the loss function and then this is step. Because we are now doing stochastic gradient descent, which means this is a rough estimate of um, the thing that we are actually interested in. So loss is basically FW. So we are interested in minimizing this function and we want the gradient so that we can minimize it. But now we are estimating it with one simple only. So you will see that that's why we have lots of noise here. Sometimes we get a very bad estimate and the loss jump up and sometimes it's going like nicely. So over time, stochastic uh, gradient descent usually will converge to the same, um, <clears throat> same local minima as gradient descent. Uh, if your data set is in a good form and usually it's the case. And so you can clearly see what's bad here. It's that the trending process become very unstable because sometimes you get a very bad estimate on the actual grad gradient that you want to compute. So a very simple way to fix this is that we have mini batch stochastic uh, gradient descent. So now we are not picking just one sample at a time. We are now pick a batch of samples. Say we randomly pick like um, K samples here. And then now we are computing, uh, estimating the actual um, gradient by uh, K samples. So this provides a better estimate of the true gradient. But now again, like why we don't want gradient descent because it's computational costly, but now we are computing K samples and it's uh, more computational uh, heavy than like computing gradient on one sample. But the benefit is that you actually get this st stability. So this is like um, a comparison, like uh, the batch gradient descent, uh, the, the standard gradient descent, also called the batch gradient descent, which means the batch size is the, the whole data set size. And for stochastic gradient descent, that means like batch is equal to one. And for mini batch gradient descent is like batch size anywhere between one and n. And so in practice, when you are, for example, like you are um, minimizing two variable and you look at the trend in progress. And so for standard batch, um, batch descent, the standard gradient descent is like very smooth, go up and then converge toward the point. And if you are doing stochastic uh, gradient descent, it's the red one. And you can see that it's like crazy jumping everywhere. And so it's hard to see whether it is actually converging because like at every point, your gradient estimate is not very, um, not very accurate. So it's hard to see when you can like, um, you actually converge and then how you can like stop the, um, like for example, if you somewhere at the end, you end up with some point here, it's still far from the actual uh, minima, but you, you don't know where is the actual minima is. And for mini batch uh, gradient descent, the green curve is actually somewhere between uh, batch and stochastic uh, gradient descent. And you can have like uh, better stability, and lower variance, but you can end up with like much faster than batch gradient descent. So yeah, so it's a quick review of gradient descent and will be probably covered in next week's um, discussion. Cool. So I think we're running out of time and any question? Yeah. Just unmute yourself.
All good. Cool. Um, then thanks for coming. Yeah, see you next week.